Welcome back to Anatomy and Physiology and our study of Chapter 3. In our last lecture, we considered the plasma membrane and transport of substances across the plasma membrane. In this lecture, we're going to move across the plasma membrane into the cell, where we'll consider cell organelles found within the cytoplasm, as well as consider the three extensions found associated with the cell, cilia, the flagellum, and microvilli, before moving on to finish this week's lecture, looking at the two phases of the cell cycle, interphase and mitosis. I wanna go ahead and start with the nucleus of the cell. The nucleus is the most prominent feature of the cell, acting as a control center for all the various cellular activities, as well as it provides the ability for cells to regenerate again and again as necessary. The nucleus has several components, including a nuclear envelope, nuclear pores, a nucleolus, and the nucleoplasm. First, the nuclear envelope, sometimes referred to as the nuclear membrane. It includes two separate bilayers, one inside the other that separates the nucleus from the cytoplasm. And so we see our nuclear envelope here. Here's one bilayer, here's a second phospholipid bilayer. And the membrane is penetrated by thousands of pores that we call nuclear pores. And we see a pore here, we see one here, we see one here. And this is going to control the movement of substances between the nucleus and the cytoplasm of the cell. Just as was discussed with other plasma membranes from last lecture, although small molecules and ions can diffuse passively, larger molecules like RNA and proteins can't actually pass through the nuclear pore by diffusion. They require energy for transport, a process we called active transport. Now, within the nucleus of our cells are one or more spherical bodies called nucleoli. They function in producing ribosomes, and each nucleolus is an accumulation of DNA, RNA, and proteins not surrounded by an enclosed membrane. Nucleoli become considerably enlarged when the cell is actively in the process of making protein, so we don't see the nucleolus surrounded by a membrane. Within the nucleus, we also find the cell's hereditary units called genes, which control cell structure and direct cellular activities. Genes are arranged in single file along chromosomes, and each chromosome is a long molecule of DNA coiled together with several different proteins and some RNA in what we call chromatin. Finally, we have the nucleoplasm. This is just a gel-like substance within the nucleus that suspends the various components we've just discussed. Recall from last week's lecture material and the study of nucleic acids as a macromolecule. Nucleic acids have three main functions, and when we're talking about DNA, we say that nucleic acids coded for hereditary information in the form of genes, so DNA within the nucleus, we're going to see coding for hereditary information. In this manner, DNA is then responsible for the transmission of hereditary information from parent to offspring via chromosomes, as well as DNA with the help of RNA and ribosomes, and a two-step process we call transcription and translation, we'll see that DNA provides all the necessary instructions needed for the production of protein in the body. So when we talk about the importance of the nucleus, we want to be thinking of DNA and that opportunity to take genetic material carrying all the hereditary information we need either to pass on to offspring or to make the proteins we need for our body. Next, we have mitochondria. Mitochondria are self-replicating organelles found in the cytoplasm of the cell. They contain their own genome, which we call mitochondrial DNA, which is both separate and distinct from the genetic information found within the nucleus of our cells. Mitochondria is maternally inherited. Now, we sometimes say that mitochondria are the powerhouse of the cell. Ultimately, this is because mitochondria are the site of energy production, the production of ATP via cell respiration. We'll look at the energy producing function of the mitochondria during the third term of A and P. Mitochondria have two distinct membrane systems separated by a space. So we see this outer green layer and this beige interior layer here. The green layer is going to surround the whole organelle and that inner membrane, which is thrown into folds that project inward, those folds are called cristae, and together the two membranes create 
two mitochondrial compartments. We have this inner matrix here in blue, as well as a very narrow intermembrane space between the outer membrane and inner membrane. Mitochondria play a critical role in generating energy in the eukaryotic cell in the form of ATP, and this process involves a number of complex pathways which make up cell respiration. Again, we'll visit this during spring term when we consider nutrition. Next, we have ribosomes. Ribosomes are small organelles that float freely in the cytoplasm, or they can sometimes be bound to an organelle that we call the endoplasmic reticulum, I'll talk about in a moment, creating what we call rough ER. Ribosomes are the site of protein synthesis, where they synthesize proteins from amino acids as dictated by the cell's DNA. They're composed of two subunits. We have a 60s and a 40s subunit. I'm not real concerned with you knowing what the meaning is behind this, except we have two of them, and they come together to start protein synthesis when we have mRNA or messenger RNA that's been produced in reading genes found in our DNA. The endoplasmic reticulum is our next organelle, and it's an extensive transport network of folded membranes that extend from the nuclear envelope where it's responsible for modifying proteins and synthesizing lipids. The ER comes in two forms, rough ER and smooth ER. Rough ER is an extension of the outer nuclear membrane that's referred to as rough because it's studded with ribosomes on its outer surface, as compared to smooth ER, which doesn't have ribosomes. Rough ER functions to process and modify proteins by folding them into their final three-dimensional shape, potentially attaching carbohydrates, even trimming off some of the amino acids in that peptide chain in order to create a functional protein. Rough ER is responsible for manufacturing the integral proteins bound for the plasma membrane, as well as can synthesize phospholipids bound for cell membranes. Smooth ER is a continuation of the rough endoplasmic membrane. So we've gone from our nuclear envelope to our rough ER here, and now we're continuing to our smooth ER. The smooth ER being a continuation serves as the recipient for the proteins that were originally synthesized by the rough ER, and it's denoted smooth because it doesn't have ribosomes. It has five major functions. First, it's the site of lipid and lipid-based molecular structure, including the site of steroid hormones. It's the site of detoxification of certain drugs and maybe chemicals of the body, which we find substantially in the liver and in the kidney, so we'll see substantial smooth ER in cells of the liver and the kidney, as well as it's responsible for the breakdown of glycogen in the liver, releasing glucose into the blood. And finally, in a specialized form of smooth ER, which we see in skeletal muscle cells, it's responsible for the storage of calcium ions involved in muscle contraction. The Golgi apparatus is our next cell organelle. It receives processed proteins from the endoplasmic reticulum, where it's responsible for sorting those proteins, processing them, sometimes breaking or cutting them up into smaller pieces if they've been formed wrong. I like to think of the Golgi as a traffic control center, like a post office or an airport terminal, where it takes things in, modifies sorts, packages, and then sends them out via membrane-enclosed vesicles, either transporting them to other regions of the cell or secreting them outside the cell entirely. There are three likely destinations, which we see here. Proteins may be sent outside the cell, being removed by exocytosis. They may be bound for the plasma membrane. Recall we have a list of ways by which the membrane proteins function. Or they may be involved as a digestive enzyme, such as lysosomes or peroxisomes we're going to discuss coming up. Now, in the last slide, I mentioned that one way by which the Golgi might package proteins up is via sacs of digestive enzymes. Specifically, some Golgi package lysosomes. And in a very general sense, lysosomes are membrane-bound digestive enzymes found in the cytoplasm of the cell, where they're often referred to as the garbage disposal system of the cell. They're somewhat spherical in nature. They're very rich in digestive enzymes, often containing 30 or up to 50 different types of enzymes responsible for the degradation or breakdown of things like proteins, nucleic acids, certain carbohydrates. And recall, because lysosomes originate in the Golgi, they're compartmentalized vesicles, and that ensures 
Only the substances flagged for destruction are in fact destroyed, rather than these enzymes being loose in the environment by which they could destroy important cell structures. We also have peroxisomes. Peroxisomes are similar to lysosomes, but they're smaller. They contain a different variety of enzymes whose primary function it is to rid the cell of toxic substances. They're responsible for oxidation reactions that break down fatty acids. Further, they help neutralize free radicals in the cell, which can cause cellular damage. And in the liver, we have special proxisomes used to detoxify alcohol and other harmful compounds. We next move to the cytoskeleton of the cell. The cytoskeleton is an important, complex, and dynamic cell component made up of proteins called microtubules, microfilaments, and intermediate filaments. The cytoskeleton gives the cell its shape, it provides structural support and gives it stability, it anchors internal components, keeping them in place, helping with movement or positioning of organelles in the cell itself. Further, components of the cytoskeleton help move different parts of the cell during mitosis or meiosis. And so we have three different types. The first, we have microfilaments, which we see here. Microfilaments are the thinnest elements of the cytoskeleton and composed of the protein actin, which is found primarily in skeletal muscle tissue to help with muscle contraction. Microfilaments are also a component found in microvilli. Those we're gonna see little finger-like projections of the plasma membrane we're going to talk about in a future slide. They're found in epithelial cells that line the small intestine and help aid greatly by increasing surface area for nutrient absorption. We also have intermediate filaments. So here are intermediate filaments. Intermediate filaments, as we can see, are a little thicker than microfilaments and are found in parts of the cell subject to mechanical stress. They help stabilize organelles, including the nucleus, within the cell. And lastly, we have microtubules. These are the largest diameter cytoskeletal elements, and they're also just the largest cytoskeletal components themselves. They're long, unbranched, hollow tubes that are assembled by a structure we call the centrosome. Microtubules help determine cell shape and function in the movement of organelles, and they also participate in chromosome movement during cell division in the process of mitosis as well as meiosis. Now that we've talked about both the cell membrane and the organelles found within the cell, I want to take a moment to mention some cell extensions. Specifically, I want to talk about cilia, flagella, and microvilli. First, we have cilia. Cilia are numerous hair-like projections that extend from the surface of a cell. So we see this here. If this is our cell surface, we would see these hair-like projections. And they are involved with moving particles in one direction. Cilia are found in the respiratory tract, which we see here and here where they sweep foreign particles trapped in mucus away from the lungs. This is an example from our PAL site that shows our cilia here along the internal lumen of the trachea. Next, we have flagella. Flagella are responsible for propulsive actions. They're actually cell projections that are longer than cilia and used to propel a cell or move a cell. During our last term of A and P at the end of the year, we're going to study the reproductive system where we'll see the flagellum involved with mature sperm movement, helping sperm move through the female reproductive tract to unite with an egg in the female fallopian tubes. Here are some slides from the PAL site where we see sperm, mature sperm stained here, many of them, and a few select sperm here that have been stained. Finally, we have microvilli, microscopic projections of the plasma membrane involved in increasing the surface area of the cell and functioning in absorption, such as with the cells that line the small intestine. And we see a nice image here, and we also see some projections out by which it's, it's real hard to see here, but there would be many microvilli projecting out here to increase the surface area if this is the lumen of the small intestine where we would want to be seeing nutrients absorbed into the bloodstream and lymphatics. Moving on from the brief description of the cell organelles, the cytoplasm, as well as our extensions of the, the cell membrane, I like to now transition to a brief talk about the cell cycle or the orderly sequence of events by which a somatic cell, that is all cells of the body with the exception of our gametes, duplicates its contents and divides into two identical cells. 
we have two main phases of the cell cycle. We have here what's called interphase and there are some subparts of interphase and then we have mitosis. So interphase and mitosis are the two main phases of the cell cycle. And you'll see a reference to cytokinesis here and I'll talk about that in a moment. Here we have an image that gives us a, a visual of the cell cycle by which we have interphase in green and then we're going to see mitosis here in yellow ending at telophase by which then we move to cytokinesis and can begin this process once again. First of all, let's talk about interphase. In interphase, the cell replicates its DNA while also producing additional organelles and components for the cytosol in preparation for cell division. We want to divide a cell. We need to duplicate all of the things found within the cell, and that's the process of interphase. We have a couple of different steps of interphase, and so here we have what's called G1 or growth phase. Then we have the S phase and G2. G1 or gap phase one. This is where the cell duplicates most of its organelles, not its DNA at this point, but most of its organelles. And it's of great interest in the study of cell proliferation and control. As cells have a point, we have G1. This is where the cell duplicates most of its organelles, now, not its DNA yet, but most of its organelles. Next, we end G1 and we get to a checkpoint here. We call it a G1 checkpoint. And what we're going to see here is DNA is examined to ensure that when it enters the next step of interphase, the S phase, it isn't about to replicate any kind of damaged DNA. So the end of G1, the checkpoint looks at DNA to say, it looks good, we can replicate it. It hasn't been damaged. Now we go into the S phase, we call this the S phase for synthesis, and in this phase, DNA replication occurs, resulting in two sets of genetic material. And then we hit the G2 phase. So here's our G2. We end the S phase and we move into another growth phase. This is final growth in preparation for cell division. Cell growth, we have a little more cell growth. And at the end, just before we move into mitosis, we're going to have another checkpoint, the G2 checkpoint, which prevents the cell from dividing if there is damaged DNA. We end interphase once we're certain that chromosomes appear normal and we begin the mitotic phase. This is where we see nuclear division, a process we call mitosis, followed by cytoplasmic division, a process we call cytokinesis. So let's go ahead now and look at this four-step process in more detail. We have four steps of mitosis, prophase, metaphase, anaphase, and telophase. First, we consider prophase. In prophase, we're going to see our chromatin fibers condense and shorten into visible chromosomes. And this is going to help prevent entanglement in terms of strands of our genetic material as they're being moved during mitosis. Recall that each of the prophase chromosomes consists of a pair of identical double-stranded chromatids. So actually during the S phase, we started off with this chromosome here and we doubled it here. Now we have two chromosomes, these are identical. We're going to have two chromosomes here. And during the process of mitosis, we'll wanna pull one of these to one side of the cell and we'll pull this other one to the other side of the cell. We have this point of attachment called the centromere by which we have a little piece of protein called a kinetochore there. Now we're going to have a pulley system here called the mitotic spindle, and we're going to have these pulley-like systems attached to the kinetic core here on the centromere in order to pull these pieces in one direction or another. Now, again, in prophase, all we've seen here is we've seen condensing, we've seen our nuclear envelope dissolve or break down, and we see these spindle fibers begin attaching to the kinetochore found here at the centromere. And that's going to help us in the next step where we're going to see metaphase take place. Now in metaphase, we're going to see our chromatids line up at what we call the metaphase plate. We see that here, it's this imaginary equatorial line by which all of our chromosomes are going to line up at the middle. Next, in anaphase, we're going to find that the centromeres are going to split, separating sister chromatid pairs, and we're going to see each of those individual, now chromatids, move 
from the middle, one is going to go in one direction of the cell and the other will go in the opposite direction of the cell. So we say that our sister chromatids are going to be separated by which we can see them here and here. They'll be moving along in this direction and this direction. So we're seeing them begin to move apart. Now lastly in telophase, this is the last stage of mitosis, and telophase begins after chromosome movement stops. The complete set of chromosomes has arrived to each pole. The nuclear envelope now is going to begin forming around each of these sets of chromosomes, and we're going to begin seeing a constriction between, this was once one big cell, and we're going to see a point of constriction whereby the cell begins to separate in two. Finally, following telophase, we're going to see the separation of organelles and cytoplasm into two separate cells. So we see separation. We have not only the chromosomes within the nuclear envelope here and here, but all the organelles will be distributed equally such that when the cell will truly separate in two, we have two equal cells. And so that happens where this contractile ring that began during telophase separates the cell into two two new cells. And so at this point, this material is going to finish chapter three and our study of cells. With our next lecture next week, we're going to move to chapter four, where we begin moving in structural hierarchy, we're moving into tissues. So now we're looking at various cells that are going to form tissues. If you have questions, don't hesitate to reach out. Meanwhile, make it a great day.